message. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Zach. If we haven't met, I'm uh, the worship leader here, and I'm one of the pastoral residents, and I get to speak with you today. I thought um, I would bring up my Michigan Cup, because if you know me, I'm a huge Michigan football fan, and I just try to find ways to rub it in Penn State fans' face all the time. So I just thought, since we won the national championship, I'll leave that there. Um, If you beat us this year, you can totally come rub it in my face. So... I will not be upset. I will be proud that we have a church that does that. So So as Rachel said, we are continuing in our series on Ephesians 6. We're going to talk about the armor of God and specifically about the breastplate of righteousness. To begin, I want to put forward some questions that I think most of us, if not all of us, have probably posed about ourselves at some point throughout our lives. How much must I do? Have I done enough? How often should I do it? How do I know if I've done enough? Have I done it correctly? Am I right? Do I measure up? You see, we have a problem. The Webster's Dictionary defines righteousness like this. It says, to be righteous, you have to be morally upright without guilt or sin. Now let that sink in for a second. This is not a Bible dictionary. This is simply just the dictionary for our current modern English. And it says that if you want to be righteous, you have to be without guilt or sin. In other words, you basically have to be perfect all the time. Now, when's the last time you used the word righteous and used it positively? More than likely, we are so used to using it in a negative framework that it's hard for us to imagine what it means to be righteous and use it in a positive framework. So, for example, you might have... Someone you know and you and your friends might think, man, he's really righteous. And because it's not the 80s, that's not a cool thing. It means means something negative about him, like he thinks he's better than you or he's trying to be better than you. Or you have a coworker maybe that you can recognize there's some self-righteousness going on in how they try to prove themselves. You see, we all inherently have this understanding that no matter how hard we try, No matter how much we want to be good people, inherently we have flaws. And if we're ever presented with someone who appears to be morally perfect, we're suspect. Their moral perfection is sort of a red flag. We know that if you live a normal human life, you're going to make mistakes. You can't be perfect. And yet, we also tell ourselves that a good human life is one well lived. So we say things like, try your best. Do good, take care of others, give it your best shot. And these are all good things, but the problem is that we live in a culture that is all about comparison. Even if you try to not compare yourself when you walk out of these doors today, you are hit and bombarded with comparison comparison everywhere. Whether it's billboards, whether it's social media, whether it's TV and commercials, we are all pitted against each other, and we see other people that seem to be maybe just a little bit better than we are in some way. So imagine this. Imagine you have a friend named Ted. And Ted is universally recognized as a really good dude. Everyone that you know loves him. You recognize that he cares for others. He puts people before himself. He's conscientious. He gives to charity. He does all of the things that you would tick on the box to say, you know what, Ted is truly an upstanding guy. But then Ted learns that you have a friend named Tammy. And Tammy just recently sold most of her belongings so that she could move overseas to help build houses for the poor. Now Ted, being a good guy, he hasn't woken up every morning thinking, how am I going to be a good person today? But he does know, hey, I'm a pretty good guy, and I'm conscientious of others, and so I'm going to try to be good. But when he sees what Tammy's done, something inside him gets a little anxious. Well, I'm not that good. I haven't sold my belongings. I haven't moved overseas. I haven't been that selfless. Am I not as good as Tammy? Is Tammy better than me? And we could ask the question, which one's more righteous? How would we even decide? You see, this is the source of a lot of our anxiety, this comparison, this, this sense that you can be a good person, and yet maybe we're not good enough. Maybe we can't measure up in some way. 
And this is also a source of anxiety when it comes to God and religion. Whether you've grown up in the church your whole life or you are brand new to faith, there's this sense that if there is a God, whoever he is and whatever he's like, he's perfect. And I'm not, no matter how good I am. And so whatever standard he would put in front of me, I can't meet it. And so we live with this sort of anxiety-inducing fear that no matter how hard I try, I just can't live up to this God that is perfect. And it gets a little bit more uncomfortable when we look at Scripture and what Scripture says about the human condition. It is amazingly clear and straightforward what it says about us as human beings. Two really quick examples. Ecclesiastes 7 says this, Surely there is no one on earth so righteous as to do good without ever sinning. Now notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that there is no one who ever does good. There are lots of really good people in this world who do a lot of really good things. The point is that there is no one who can do good without sinning. And we'll return to that in a few minutes. Romans 3 then says this, For we have all already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside, and together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness, not even one. Now that is a really depressing introduction to a sermon, is it not? And I promise it's going to get better. So we're going we're to start low, and we're going to try and work our way up. We're going we're gonna to feel a little better about ourselves. But the point is this. We're here to talk about righteousness, and it's not a fun topic to talk about. And the good news that I want to hopefully get across today is that the righteousness we're here to talk about is God's righteousness and not ours. Now, if you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard things like this. Like, you, we have been given the righteousness of God. We are to put on the righteousness of God. God has given you this gift of grace. And those are all great, but what does it mean? What does it practically look like that we have been given God's righteousness? And how is this good news for our lives? How does it help amend the mess we've made of our lives through sin? So that's what I want to look at today. I want to spend a little bit of time looking at what it means that God is righteous, and then I want to dig in practically to say, okay, now that we've looked at that, what does it actually do for us? How does this actually practically work in our lives? So first, what does it mean that God is righteous? If you are anything like me, growing up, I really was uncomfortable with the idea that God is righteous. I had this Understanding of God, that he is this abstract being out there. And he's out there and he has these perfect qualities. He has these characteristics. And one of them is righteousness. Another one was maybe that he's holy, that he's pure, that he's perfect. You have, we have all of these words. And I had the sense that there was this abstract God out there who's perfect. And because he's perfect, he looks down on me in my imperfectness, the fact that I'm not like him, and he judges me for it. I was afraid of this God's righteousness because I knew for vast portions of my life, and even still today, I just, I don't measure up. Now, this also feeds into the fact that we have a tendency to view God as just a bigger, better version of ourselves. We think that whatever it means for God to be God, he's kind of like us, but he's just bigger and better. So, God is, like, we are loving, and so God is more loving. He loves more perfectly. Or God's mercy is just bigger and better than ours. God's power is just bigger and stronger and more, has more ability than ours does. And we just think of God in this way. Put it in terms of emotion. You and I, as human beings, in a 24-hour span, can experience an entire spectrum of emotion. If you slept well last night, you probably woke up and you felt pretty good. You were content. And maybe you were happy. And then as you wake up, if you have kids, maybe you walk down the hallway and you stepped out a Lego. And immediately, you're frustrated. And maybe you thought, why does my kid keep doing that? And then you, maybe you make up with your child and you have a great breakfast with your spouse or someone else and all of a sudden you're happy and you're feeling joy again. But then on your way to work, someone cuts you off and you're frustrated with that person and why didn't they learn to drive better? And 
This goes on and on throughout the day. We experience emotion after emotion after emotion, and sometimes there's nothing actually connecting each one as we go throughout the day. The problem is we think that God is also like this. We wake up, and we think God's kind of neutral about us each morning. And then if I read my Bible, now God's happy and satisfied with me. But then when I step on the Lego and upset at my son, now he's angry at me. But then if I make up with God and I make up with my son, now he's happy with me again. And on and on the spiral goes. And you can see why this is so anxiety-inducing. What we're really doing is thinking that God's emotions, God's intentions towards you change depending on your and my performance. If I do the right things, God will take care of me. God's happy. If I don't do the right things, God's angry. God's wrathful. God's intentions towards me change. This really gets at the heart of why we don't like the idea that God is righteous, because we think of God's righteousness as this thing out there, and he's looking down on my unrighteousness, and because I can't ever do enough of the right things, he's constantly judging me for it, and I can't live up to his standard. Fleming Rutledge has this great quote about God's righteousness that I think helps us get at the heart of this matter. She says this, God's righteousness is not an attribute, but a power. Righteousness does not mean moral perfection. It is not a distant, forbidding characteristic of God that humans are supposed to try to emulate or imitate. There is no good news in that. Instead, the righteousness of God is God's powerful activity of making right what is wrong in the world. When we read in both the Old and New Testaments that God is righteous, we are to understand that God is at work in his creation doing right. He is overcoming evil, delivering the oppressed, raising the poor from the dust, vindicating the voiceless victims who have no one to defend him. God's righteousness is not an attribute. She's not saying God isn't holy, God isn't pure, God isn't right. Yes, he is. But when we talk about God's righteousness, we're simply just talking about who God is. What it means for God to be merciful, what it means for God to be wrathful, to be righteous, are just different aspects of saying, this is just who God is. Now, really quick, I want to pause here and do like a brief theology 101, because it will be helpful as we go. One of the things, if... Um, you go to seminary, at least for me, I was taught early on that it's really important to recognize that God is not needy. And that sounds really weird to say, and it was strange for me when I first thought about it. But this is why we run into so many problems when we think about God. We think that God is needy, like us. We think God is just a bigger, better version of ourselves. But think about what it means for you to be you. You get hungry. You get tired. You get hangry. You get frustrated. You can experience joy and then immediately experience frustration. You need to grow. You need to change. And we kind of sometimes think that God is like this, just a little bit more perfect, a little bit better. But God doesn't need anything. Whatever he does, he does for you. So when it comes to God's righteousness... We often think that God's righteousness means that he wants you to recognize just how righteous he is because he needs the recognition. But God doesn't need you to recognize the fact that he's righteous. He needs nothing. He's full in himself. So go, whatever we mean by God's righteousness, then we have to think about it in terms of what it does for us. So all throughout scripture, you'll hear things like you're commanded to... Praise God. We're commanded to worship God. God want, invites us to adore him. And we think that God wants us to do that because he needs it. But God, whatever it means for us to adore God, it must mean that adoring God does something for us. It's good for us in some way. And that's why God calls us to do it. Remember what Fleming Rutledge said. The righteousness of God is his powerful activity of making right what is wrong in the world. He's in the world making right among us. He's not an abstract thing out there lording it over us. Two very different types of gods there. So if he's making right what is wrong in the world, and this is getting at what it means for God to be righteous, what is it that he's writing? What is the wrong that's in the world? Well, the obvious answer here is sin. Now, again, for me, growing up, I thought about sin as a very individual thing. So for me, what it meant to sin was that I do bad things, 
and I make bad choices, I have bad thoughts, and therefore God is upset at me. So I had this very one-on-one view of God. And all I saw was God, and all God sees is me. The problem with that view, there is some truth in it, but what it does is it completely ignores how my sin affects my neighbor, my friend, my coworker, my family, and on and on. It has nothing to do with the fact that we are relational human beings. It's just about me. And the ironic thing is that this is exactly what sin does. Sin warps us inward like this. And so it is that very sin that's making me just worry about myself, my actions, my thoughts. And what does God think of me? And am I okay before God? All throughout Scripture, sin is a power that enslaves us. It forces us to turn inward so all we can see is here. You could say it forces us to navel gaze constantly. We are only preoccupied with the self. We forget the neighbor. Sin is what causes me to wrong myself and those around me. Listen to what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's gone through most of his teaching, and now this is the very end. And listen to how he ends. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Boom! Anxiety. Every... (laughs) Every time I read the Sermon on the Mount, I'm like, yes, 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 this is great. And then he's like, be perfect. And I'm like, dang it. Because we can't do that. And we, again, it's because we think about God's righteousness as he's perfect and we're not. And he judges us because we're not perfect. But look at what Jesus says it means for God to be perfect. All of it has to do with how we relate to others, how God relates to others. God's perfection lies in that he loves his enemies and those that love him. He sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. He loves those who are evil and those who are good. That is what it means for God to be perfect. He is not for himself. He is for others. And because, this is where the theology 101 gets important, because he's not needy, he can do this fully. He is able to love you without you needing to love him back. He's able to give you grace without you having to then earn it back. There's no quid pro quo with God. He doesn't offer you grace and then say, okay, now earn it in some way. It's because of who he is. He doesn't need anything. So he's able to give himself to you freely. Okay, so quick recap. If God's righteousness is more better thought of as who he is and his ability to be in the world with us, making right what is wrong, but we've also seen that we are enslaved to this power of sin so that no matter how good we try, and we can be very good, we will still do good imperfectly. What are we going to do? We're trapped in this situation. And obviously, this is the point where the gospel makes perfect sense. I earlier read in Romans 3 how it said, there are none who are righteous. And then a few paragraphs down, Paul continues in Romans 3, and this is what he says. He says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Elsewhere, elsewhere, Paul will talk about the fact that God is just and that he justifies the ungodly. God's righteousness is that he's here among us 
in Jesus righting wrongs. He doesn't say God is righteous so that you can earn his gift, you can earn his grace. If you believe in Jesus the right way or enough, you are simply justified by what Jesus has done through God's grace, and that is what it means that God is righteous. It's not about God. It's about you. It's about him restoring how you view yourself and how you relate to others. Okay, now I want to get practical. We've been doing some thoughts, some theology. Now I want to bring this down. What does this actually mean? What does it look like? How can we think about this day to day? Earlier in Ephesians 4, so we're looking at Ephesians 6 in the armor of God. Just before this in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about the old man and the new man, or the old self and the new self. He says the old self is the one that's corrupted by sin and desires, and it's, it's the way that we are inward facing, and we can't escape it. And the new man is what's given to us in Jesus that frees us from that enslavement. So listen to this from Ephesians 4. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupted and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away all falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. This new self, one way we can look at it, is that this is simply the righteousness of God given to us that is extended through grace, and we can wake up each morning and put it on. The point of it, though, and this is where it can be so freeing and liberating, is it's not just about you. So if the old self, if sin corrupts us and causes us to do this, and only think about me and my relationship with God and is God angry with me and how have I done wrong today and and how can I make it up and how can I fix it? If that's what sin does, what the new self does, what the righteousness of God does to us is when that comes on, it forces us to look up. So a way to think about it is sin makes us do this. The righteousness of God forces our head up to now see you, to see me, to see our neighbor, our friend, our coworker, our family member. What sin does is forces us into a posture of preoccupation with ourself. God's grace frees us from that self-preoccupation to now actually see our neighbor, to see others. Think about how exhausting it is to think about yourself all day long. It, you get tired of thinking about how good am I, how bad am I, am I better at this, oh, I need to be like that person, well, maybe I could be like this. And you can go on and on, you can live your whole life this way, and it's exhausting. What God's grace does, what the righteousness of God does, is free us fully from that need to be self-occupied. One thing I love about Paul's language is he talks about you are to clothe yourself with Christ. He uses a bunch of different images in his writings. He'll say you are to be renewed in your mind. You are to clothe yourself with Christ. You are to be conformed to the image of Jesus. These are all different ways of talking about put on the new man that's been freely given to you. Now, the point here is that you can put it on because God gives it to you by grace. You don't earn it. There's no way to earn it. There's nothing you can do, but you're simply able to say, okay, and to respond and to obey. And because it was given to you freely, you can actually lift your head up and not worry about yourself so much. This is what it means to wear the armor of God, I think. It's to put on the new man. One way you could think about it is that the armor of God is simply the type of clothing that you wear in God's kingdom. Mark, the last few weeks when he was introducing the sermon series, talked about the fact that there's an evil day. And that can be thought of as like some end time cataclysmic evil day. It can also be today, this afternoon, it can be tomorrow. We still live in a world that is enslaved to sin. It is still being renewed. God is still at work in the world. And the armor of God allows us to participate with God and what he's doing. 
God freely comes to us, invites us to come with him by grace, and says, look at what I'm doing. Look at how I see the world. Look at how I see you, and look at how I see your neighbor. Follow me. Come with me. And because it's by grace, you can actually follow him without worry, without feeling like, am I enough? Am I doing enough? Will I live up to it? The great news is that it's not up to us. God's already given us the righteousness that is enough for us today. And whatever battle and whatever trial or season you go through. And so, as we close, I think it's fitting to end today with communion. One of the things we're doing when we come to the table is that we are receiving that invitation of Jesus to be a part of his family, to be a part of his kingdom, to receive that grace new today. And so what I would like for you to do is when we go to the table is to take the elements and take a few moments while the band sings and think about what does it look like for me today and then tomorrow morning and the day after that to clothe myself with Christ, to put on the new man that frees me from all of my worries, from my self-preoccupation, from my worry that I'm not righteous. What does that look like for you wherever you are in life? So Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, thank you for this day that you've brought us together. Thank you for this opportunity for us to be together, to worship you, to hear your word, and now to come to your table and hear your words of grace and your invitation. Lord, I ask that you work in our hearts, renew our minds, reveal to us today how best to clothe ourselves with you. Amen. You can feel free to go to the table, take the elements, and you can take them here in your seat while the band sings.
Thank you for the chance to come to the table and to remember who you are and what you've done for us, Father, and the free gift of your righteousness that you have given us today and always, Father. We pray that as we go out from here that we would be free to see our neighbor, to see each other, and to lift each other up towards you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us for our last song? Amen.